Good afternoon, and welcome to Twilio's Q3 2018 Earnings Conference Call. My name is Cheryl, and I will be your operator for today's call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. Later, we will conduct a question and answer session. I would now turn the call over to Greg Kleiner, Vice President of Investor Relations and Treasurer. Mr. Kleiner, you may begin. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Twilio's third quarter 2018 earnings conference call. Joining me today are Jeff Lawson, our co-founder and CEO, George Hu, our COO, Kozema Ship Chandler, our incoming CFO, and Lee Kirkpatrick, our outgoing CFO. The primary purpose of today's call is to provide you with information regarding our 2018 third quarter performance, in addition to our financial outlook for our 2018 fourth quarter and full year. Please note that we will not be discussing the pending merger of Twilio and SendGrid, as we will soon be in the SEC review process of the joint proxy statement prospectus related to the pending transaction. Q&A at the end of the call will be limited to matters related to our third quarter earnings. Some of our discussions and responses to your questions may contain forward-looking statements, including, but not limited to, statements regarding our future performance, including our financial outlook, our pending acquisition of SendGrid, impacts or and expected results from changes in our relationship with our larger customers, our market opportunity and market trends, the growth of our customer base, customer adoption of our products, our momentum, the benefits of our business model, our delivery of new products or product features, and our ability to execute on our vision. These statements are subject to risks, uncertainties, and assumptions. Should any of these risks or uncertainties materialize, or should any of our assumptions as outlined in our earnings release and the documents referred to in that release proved to be incorrect, actual company results could differ materially from these forward-looking statements. The discussion of the risks and uncertainties related to our business is contained in our most recent Form 10-Q filed with the SEC on August 8, 2018, and our remarks during today's discussion should be considered to incorporate this information by reference. Forward-looking statements represent our beliefs and assumptions only as of the date such statements are made. We undertake no obligation to update any forward-looking statements made during this call to reflect events or circumstances after today or to reflect new information or the occurrence of unanticipated events except as required by law. Also, during this call, we may present both GAAP and non-GAAP financial measures. Reconciliations of these non-GAAP financial measures to the most directly comparable GAAP financial measures are available in our earnings release, which we issued a short time ago. We encourage you to read our earnings release as it contains important information about GAAP and non-GAAP results, as well as the reasons why we present guidance for our non-GAAP financial measures of income from operations and net income per share, but not the comparable GAAP measures. The earnings release is available on the Investor Relations page of our website and is part of a Form 8K furnished to the SEC. Finally, at times in our prepared comments or in responses to your questions, we may offer incremental metrics to provide greater insight into the dynamics of our business or our quarterly or annual results. Please be advised that this additional detail may be one time in nature, and we may or may not provide an update in the future on these metrics. I encourage you to visit our investor relations website at investors.twilio.com to access our earnings release, periodic SEC reports, a webcast replay of today's call, or to learn more about Twilio. I'll now turn the call over to Jeff. Thank you, Greg. Welcome, everybody, to this quarter's call. Now, before I begin, life handed me the microphone on this election day, so I feel it's my responsibility to remind everybody listening to please take the time to vote. Thank you. Now, on with the call. In Q3, we drove success for our customers once again, which translated into another strong set of financial results. Our relentless focus on innovation and empowering developers continues to resonate in the market, powering our platform business model. And as George will talk through in a moment, we are adding important new logos and driving deeper relationships with existing customers as well. The investments we are making in innovation and go-to-market are clearly working. Base revenue, the primary metric we focus on, grew by 68% in the third quarter to more than $154 million. Total revenue grew a similar amount to nearly $169 million. Core voice and messaging, our largest businesses, continue to fuel our results. The relationships our go-to-market team are building with our customers 
drove our dollar-based net expansion rate to 145% in the quarter as we continue to unlock more and more use cases within our customer base with a growing set of products. As I've been discussing throughout the year, our top two priorities for 2018 are to further our push into a strategic software platform for customer engagement through our build-out of the Engagement Cloud and to expand our position as developers' first choice for communications. And coming off our annual Signal Conference last month, we made several advancements in both categories. At the Engagement Cloud layer, we announced the general availability of our contact center application platform, Flex. Flex was the result of many years of helping customers build out new contact centers on Twilio, listening to them, and learning about the complexities of what they were tackling. An important part of Flex is the Workforce Optimization, or WFO, product that we added through the acquisition of Wydica in the third quarter. We've been working with Wydica for a long time, and they have become an integral part of the Flex build-out and the success we saw with early customers. Reporting and analytics are key components of any enterprise-grade contact center, and we're thrilled to be able to offer this product as a core component of Flex. At Signal, we had Shopify on stage, describing how they built and launched Flex for more than 1,000 agents in the course of about five months, with three developers and two interns, mind you. We had several more customers commit to Flex pre-launch in the third quarter, and we have many more customers in our pipeline. Of course, we have a lot of work to do to make our early customers successful, but I really think we've hit an important market need with a pretty unique offering. For the first time, customers can now have their cake and eat it too. Flex combines the scalability and reliability of our cloud platform with the ability to programmatically customize every element of the contact center experience. This is a powerful combination. And we believe we've created a fundamentally new way of delivering software value to customers, which will serve us well as we continue to build out the engagement cloud over time. And as we look to grow Flex, particularly in the enterprise, helping our customers process payments in a compliant way is very important to unlocking the full opportunity. How many times has everyone listening today read their credit card number to a contact center operator? More times than I'm sure any of us want to count. But to help support this vision for our customers, we had two key announcements at Signal, the launch of Twilio Pay and our PCI certification. Accepting credit card payments over the phone has long been a complex and expensive process, but no more. Twilio Pay allows developers to add one line of code to their application to process payments while using our programmable voice products, all in a compliant way. Our launch partner for Pay is Stripe one of the pioneers in empowering developers around the world to more seamlessly embed payments into their software. The credit card information captured securely through Pay will be processed on their platform. And we couldn't have launched Pay without our voice platform being PCI certified. For those familiar with the payments industry, PCI, or Payment Card Industry, certification is a must for any company's processing, transmitting, or storing consumers' credit card information. Until now, companies had to face the complexity of becoming PCI compliant themselves or use a hardware-based payment processing tool with limited customizability. Our programmable voice product has been granted Payment Card Industry Data Security Standard, that's PCI DSS, Level 1 certification, meaning that customers can now use our platform to process payments securely without having to do the development or complete the annual audits themselves. All of that is taken care of by our platform. Flex and pay together make a great experience for customers. Another subject on the mind of nearly every enterprise and developer in 2018 is artificial intelligence, AI, and how to harness this technology to create great experiences. To date, AI and bots have largely been a lot of hype, leading to lots of unfulfilled promises and poor experiences for many consumers. At Signal last year, we announced Understand, our first foray into the machine learning natural language understanding space, to begin our work with customers to unlock this opportunity. 
And at Signal this year, we launched Autopilot, the next evolution of this product. With a natural language understanding engine, a conversational application platform, and an omni-channel hub. What that means is Autopilot is a fully programmable conversational AI platform for building custom bots, IVRs, and even home assistant apps. With Autopilot, we're empowering developers to build bots in real life, at scale, and with the user experience in mind. This requires conversational logic to enable natural interactions. The ability for developers to use their own data to train their bots to get smarter over time, and the intelligence to hand off the conversation to an agent if needed, without losing any of the context. Oh, and by the way, this needs to happen across all channels, voice, messaging, personal assistance, a difficult task, but a common theme across many of our product efforts. Really nailing an individual channel is powerful for companies but the number of channels is growing more complex by the day, and enabling developers to build once and deploy across multiple channels is incredibly powerful. We also had two programmable wireless announcements at Signal. First, the Twilio SuperSIM expands our efforts to provide global connectivity for our growing list of IoT customers through a single API. We are, in essence, duplicating the approach we took with the super network and the build out of our voice and messaging footprint. We added relationships with the three group, Singtel, and Telefonica, increasing our network reach significantly across Europe, Asia, and Latin America. And we plan to add more over time. Developers can now, through our software, use one API to optimize the connectivity to local carriers around the world for their devices containing our SIM card. As with voice and messaging before it, this allows our customers to focus on product innovation rather than mobile infrastructure or network access. We also took an exciting step towards the future of wireless connectivity by launching the nation's first developer platform for the emerging narrowband connectivity market, or NBIoT, in partnership with T-Mobile. You've heard me mention in the past what we see coming with NBIoT and how it has the potential to increase the addressable market for devices exponentially. See, most of the IoT use cases we've seen to date have been focused on high-value items like cars, scooters, or freight, connected by expensive modems. This market is still emerging and has a ton of exciting development going on. However, NB-IoT is designed for devices consuming smaller data payloads. Think timestamps or GPS coordinates status updates, or the like. And because the data consumption is lower, the modems can be cheaper and the power requirements can be substantially lower. This opens up the potential for a whole new class of devices that, for example, could run for years on a single AA battery and have the lifetime bandwidth consumption easily included in the price of the device. This technology is really going to open up some interesting possibilities for developers of the world and we can't wait to see what they build. We also celebrated a milestone at Signal, the five-year anniversary of Twilio.org. When we started Twilio.org, we set out an ambitious goal of sending a billion messages for good over a 10-year time frame. And through a lot of hard work and the power of our platform, we accomplished that in just five years. So our new 10-year goal is to have social impact organizations worldwide use the platform to help 1 billion people every single year. I'm incredibly proud of the work the team has done to date and the impact we're having on people's lives around the world. And as investors, I hope you are as well. Beyond the great work Twilio.org is doing, their customers are currently driving more than 1% of Twilio's overall revenue. And this segment is growing even faster than the overall business. So we believe that doing good is also good for business. Overall, Signal was an amazing event once again this year. I always come out of Signal super energized by all of the customer interactions we have, the new faces we get to meet, and the opportunities we discover by bringing everyone together. There are two other things I wanted to touch on briefly, management additions and our new headquarters both important steps we've taken to prepare us for the future. 
We announced a couple weeks ago that after a long and thorough search, Kozema Ship Chandler will be joining Twilio as our new CFO. As I've discussed with many of you, the primary attribute we've been looking for was someone with a track record of operational excellence at scale to take us through the next phase of our growth. Kozema has spent more than 20 years at GE in a number of financial leadership roles across several multi-billion dollar businesses. Most recently, Kozema was GE's digital chief commercial officer. Prior to that, he was the CFO and EVP of Corp Dev for GE Digital, the VP of corporate audit staff at GE, as well as the CFO of several other GE divisions. We're thrilled to have him on board. Also, earlier in the quarter, we added Niels Pullman as our Chief Trust and Security Officer. Niels is a 20-year veteran of the security industry, having served as the Chief Technology Officer of Endgame and Chief Security Officer at Zynga, Qualys, and Electronic Arts. He also co-founded the Cloud Security Alliance nonprofit organization, which promotes the use of best practices for security assurance within cloud computing. You've heard me say many times that trust is the number one thing we sell, and Niels is a great addition to help shape our efforts here going forward. In terms of our new headquarters, we've already outgrown our current facilities in San Francisco, and we'll be moving into a new building in 2019, actually the old Salesforce building in Rincon Plaza. We've acquired roughly two and a half times the square footage we currently have in San Francisco, which will be brought online in phases over the next couple of years to support our growth. There's a lot of great history in that building, and I look forward to adding to it. And while we always have an eye towards the future, we continue to focus on what matters most, making our customers successful. You can see that in our results, as well as in the investments we're making in the future. We're operating in an enormous market, communications, at a tipping point in its transformation into software and a market where customers have been misserved by the incumbents. As I noted at Signal, we're in the early stages of a great communications renaissance. We're investing in this future, and we believe customers will continue to reward us for these efforts. Now, before I hand this call over to George, I did want to acknowledge Lee's many contributions to Twilio. Lee, you've been instrumental in making Twilio what it is today. And it's been a pleasure working with you for the last six and a half years. Thank you for everything you've done for the company over the years, including giving us the time to find such an amazing successor to the legacy you're leaving here at Twilio. George, let me turn the call over to you for an update on our go-to-market efforts. Thanks, Jeff. I'd like to start by also thanking Lee for his tremendous contributions to Twilio. It's been my real pleasure to work with him over the last 18 months, and we will all miss him, and we wish him the absolute best for his future. Now on to Q3. The go-to-market team did a great job once again executing against Twilio's massive opportunity. Our core motion of bringing new customers onto the platform and making existing customers even more successful continues to work quite well. We remain focused on our three core priorities, winning the hearts and minds of developers, increasing our account coverage, and building the foundation for future growth. Coming off my second signal at Twilio, we saw incredible momentum from developers, customers, executives, and partners. We moved to a larger venue to accommodate our growing community this year, and our team put on a spectacular event. The reaction from developers to the new product announcements was amazing. We also had our largest ever super class, a full day developer hands-on training session. In addition to a strong developer turnout, we also had enterprise speakers from companies like FedEx, Domino's, 1-800-Flowers, Shopify, and more on the main stage talking about why and what they've built with Twilio. We also held our first ever creators track, a VIP track to serve our growing community of business executives. At Twilio, we believe executives are doers, too. They're helping to bring the communications renaissance Jeff discussed earlier to their companies. We had more than 100 registrants to this track, who I believe walk, walked away seeing Twilio in a more strategic light. Another new component of Signal this year was our partner summit. As I've been discussing throughout the year, we are in the midst of building out our partner program, 
which I believe will be an important driver of our growth in the future. We had several hundred people registered for the Partner Summit, and our main session was standing room only. We are seeing many companies coming from the legacy communications world who want to learn how to transition to the new world of the cloud, and they're making substantial commitments to build this future with us. Turning back to Q3, we had a number of exciting new deals in the past quarter. As Jeff alluded to, we signed a number of flex deals in the third quarter, so let's start there. Lyft is a longtime customer of Twilio, and we're thrilled to expand that relationship in the past quarter by adding them to the growing list of companies using Flex to reinvent their customer support experience. Lyft aims to deliver a caring experience to all of their constituents, whether it be riders, drivers, or applicants, and to do so at scale. They have thousands of contact center agents dealing with these three groups of users, all with very different needs, like lost and found, billing, safety, and more. In many cases, they have different systems and sources of data for each of these users across a number of disparate channels and interaction points, requiring their agents to look in multiple places to surface the necessary information in order to provide a resolution. Lyft chose Flex to support their rapidly growing business because it gave them the freedom to build a truly differentiated and customized omni-channel experience to provide better outcomes faster. Flex can not only bring all of their different channels under one roof, but also becomes the abstraction layer to all of the underlying systems. This enables a more contextual and personalized resolution process for all involved, while also giving Lyft the ability to not only respond to, but anticipate and resolve future problems before they surface. We also signed a large deal with Medallia in the last quarter. Many of you may know Medallia. They are a rapidly growing cloud software company focused on helping companies build better customer and employee experiences. And we're going to power the SMS channel of their new Medallia Conversations product, which helps companies gather feedback and interact with customers in real time to improve their experience as it's unfolding. Our global footprint and highly reliable platform were keys to this win. On the enterprise side, we had a great win at a Fortune 500 financial services firm in the past quarter. You may remember our deal with Morgan Stanley last year. We landed a similar opportunity with another bank who was looking to empower better and regulatory compliant communications between their many thousands of financial advisors and their clients. Using Twilio, banks can now enable advisors to use their personal phones to text with their clients while maintaining compliance. We also signed a new deal with a Fortune 500 medical testing company in Q3. This company is looking to improve their CRM system. And as part of this effort, we'll be using our messaging platform to send SMS notifications for lab work, medication reminders, appointment reminders, and more. So overall, I'm thrilled with the continued momentum the team has been able to deliver, not only with short-term success, but also laying the groundwork for further success over the long term. Before I pass the mic over to Lee, I did want to acknowledge the passing of a great friend and longtime colleague of mine, Ron Huddleston, our Chief Partner Officer. For those of you who never had the privilege to know Ron, he was a one-of-a-kind partner leader and one of the most positive, energetic executives I've ever known. Even though Ron was only at Twilio a short time, he made a tremendous impact by launching our Twilio Build program and hiring an amazing partner team that will continue to carry out his vision. We will all miss him tremendously. With that, let me pass the mic to Lee to discuss our financial results. Thank you, George, and good afternoon, everyone. The business continues to perform well in the third quarter as more and more companies are turning to Twilio to help transform the way they engage with their customers. Revenue growth was strong once again, with base revenue growing at 68% year over year. Excluding Uber, growth was 70%. The power of our business model was evident in our dollar-based net expansion rate, coming in at 145% or 147% without Uber. Please note that after the fourth quarter, we'll be moving away from the ex-Uber metrics. Overall, our growing list of product innovations, coupled with an expanded presence in the field, continues to drive success with customers. The top 10 active customer accounts contributed 18% of total revenue in Q3, compared to 17% last quarter and 17% in Q3 of 2017. Our top two customers, 
WhatsApp and Uber contributed 6% and 4% of total revenue, respectively. We had six variable customer accounts in the third quarter. Gross margins came in above 55% in the third quarter, a bit higher than the range we've seen in the past four quarters. I would remind everyone of the same strategy we've been discussing since the IPO. We remain focused on doing the right things to grow the business long-term rather than maximizing gross margins in the near term. But simply, we are not a gross margin expansion story in the near term, so expect fluctuations in our gross margin. We continue to see things that could impact our gross margins like product, country, and customer mix, network service provider fees, FX, and more. An example of this is an expected change in Q1 2019 in our SMS messaging business through Verizon in the U.S. Previously, Verizon had treated all P2P, or person-to-person, -person, and A2P, or application-to-person, messaging the same. Starting in February, Verizon is planning on creating a new service offering which will add a quarter of a penny fee per message to all businesses with A2P SMS messaging use cases. This type of thing has happened before. The carriers added a similar fee to short code messages a while back. Our short code business continues to grow rapidly and we expect the same in SMS as well, giving us effectiveness as a channel. Operationally, as with the short code fees in the past, we will be passing this surcharge on to our customers. So I will not impact the gross profit dollars we receive when customers send SMS messages to Verizon subscribers. Mathematically, it will impact our gross margin. We estimate approximately 100 basis point drag on a quarterly basis to our corporate gross margin when this goes into effect in February of next year. Something like this that impacts the optics of our gross margins, but not the reality of our business on a gross profit basis, is a great example of why we have not been focused on maximizing gross margin percentage in the near term. For your models, we ended the quarter with 1,274 employees with 24 added through acquisition. Our international mix of revenue was 26%. You'll also notice in the statement of cash flows about $30 million spent on acquisitions in the third quarter. The majority of this was for the Wydeca acquisition Jeff mentioned earlier. We also purchased a small company to support our growing programmable wireless efforts. Neither acquisition had a material impact to our top or bottom line results in the third quarter and expect that to be the case again in the fourth quarter. Looking forward to the next year, we're in the midst of our annual planning process, so we won't be providing detailed 2019 guidance this time. However, I do want to provide some color on a few items. As Jeff mentioned earlier, we will be moving into new headquarters starting into the first quarter of 2019. Financially, this will have a couple of impacts. In CapEx, you should expect about $40 million of build-out costs split mostly across the next three quarters. At the operating line, the fact that we'll be paying double rent will likely push us close to break even on the operating line for Q1. Like most other businesses, we face seasonal costs from payroll taxes, 401k match payments, and the like in the first quarter of the year. And the extra rent situation will put incremental pressure on operating expenses in Q1. As this is my last conference call as CFO of Twilio, I want to thank all the customers, employees, and investors that I've had the pleasure of working with along the way. Twilio is a special place, and Jeff, it's been an honor to work closely with you and the leadership team over the years. I'm incredibly proud to lead the company in such great shape and hand the reins over to Kozema for the next stage of Twilio's journey. It's still day one. Thank you, everyone. Operator? To ask a question, please star one on your telephone keypad. Please limit yourself to one question. The first question comes from the line of Itai Kidron of Oppenheimer. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Uh, thanks. Uh, again, you leave us speechless with great results, so congrats, guys. Um, and Lee, uh, thank you to you and uh, Kuzema. Good luck to you in your new role, although it doesn't seem like you need to do much there. Um, you know, business doing very good. A couple of things, Jeff. Maybe you could talk about the diversity of the business activity. I mean, clearly your guys are executing very well, but help us think about the breadth of your product adoption uh, within customers. How much of that is a driver uh, versus your core voice and messaging? And then, Lee, on your commentary on on one Q on the gross margin, the Verizon impact. Uh, can you help us maybe translate the 1%, uh, uh, I think a quarter of a penny, I think you mentioned. Can you mention that in percent terms? What per price increase is it from a 
percent standpoint, and if you're passing it to customers, why would there be still a gross margin impact? Hey, this is Jeff. I'll, I'll, I'll start the answer, and then I'll hand it over to Lee. So, uh, you know, you asked about the diversity, and it really is strength across the board, both in uh, the customers, the customer segments, the customer sizes, um, as well as in the products. Now, uh, across the customers, you know, we're seeing great use cases at companies, uh, really, you know, big and small, new and old. Uh, from our customer standpoint, you see a very strong uh, dollar-based net expansion rate, 145% this quarter. But we're also doing, uh, I think, an excellent job bringing on new customers as well. But obviously, they're earlier in their in their journey uh, with Twilio. Um, as far as products go, you know, you do see, um, uh, you know, most of the growth is provided by our core products, voice and messaging. Those are our largest revenue items. But we are very excited about. Uh, products like Flex coming on board, and we think in the future we'll be meaningful drivers of revenue as well. But today, it's still largely our core products, voice and messaging, that are driving most of our performance. And Lee? Yeah, Itai, so in terms of pricing, it's a quarter of a penny uh, fee on top of our three quarters of a cent a list price. Uh, again, no impact on gross profit, but since we're passing it through, it impacts both the numerator and denominator, so the gross margin will decrease. Got it. All right, good luck, guys. Your next question is from Nikolai Boloff of Bank of America. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Hi, guys. Thanks for taking my questions, and congratulations on uh, impressive performance, another quarter here of, of, of good performance. I just wanted to dig a little bit deeper into the expansion rate, and maybe if you can just uh, discuss the continued momentum and increase here in maybe three buckets. What are you seeing uh, in terms of consumption by large, medium, and small enterprises? The second bucket would be the impact from the newer channels. Uh, at Signal, WhatsApp seems to be doing well, whether WhatsApp and video are contributing to the increase in the expansion right here. And lastly, is there more like customer pool beginning to happen versus you guys pushing in and, and giving ideas to customers in terms of like additional use cases you can drive? Uh, this is George. Uh, let me tackle those. Uh, thank you. Thanks for the question. Let me tackle each of those. Uh, in terms of the uh, the net expansion rate, we see that across the board. Honestly, it's not concentrated in small, medium, or large customers. We're very excited to see it um, being uh, strong across the board. Uh, in terms of the new channels, uh, we definitely see a lot of, I would say, developer interest in new channels, and some of them are early for us, like WhatsApp. Uh, but as Jeff said, but as Jeff said, the the most important um, driver of our net expansion and, and growth is the core is the core or are the core products. Um, and then in terms of customer pull versus push, I would say that we consistently have had uh, a lot of customer pull. I don't think that's a new thing for us. And if you think about our core um, kind of strategy, which is to win the hearts and minds of developers uh, first, uh, those are the ones that are bringing us into customers, but they're, they're also the ones that are often uh, dreaming up or tasked with coming up with new ideas and new use cases. And so I think that's what helps drive the efficiency of our go-to-market model is to have that that developer-led uh, customer pull, to use your language. Got it, and I have a quick question for Lee, if you don't mind. Lee, um, Flex, I, just doing the math, two-thirds of the Flex price is software, one-third is usage. If I assume 80% gross margin for software and 55 for usage, Flex should be around 70% gross margins. I was just wondering whether that makes sense. Uh, or in general, if you can comment uh, whether Flex will be gross margin accretive. Yeah, absolutely. So you're thinking about the right way, and your uh, numbers are definitely in the range. Uh, Flex, it will be accretive on a gross margin basis. Just keep in mind, you know, we just, we just went GA this quarter, so it will take time to roll out and have an overall impact. Got it. Thank you. As a reminder, please limit yourself to one question and one question only. Your next question comes from the line of Mark Murphy of J.P. Morgan. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Yes, thank you a lot, Mike. Congrats, and uh, welcome to uh, Kozema. Um, but I wanted to start for a question with Lee. You, you've been trying to factor in the pipeline, I think, a little more fully into guidance. And, um, of course, the magnitude of upside might be a touch less than it was uh, in Q2, but it's still a lot of upside. I guess I'm curious, did something in particular surprise to the upside? Um, any particular product, any particular customer segment or usage scenario? And, and did, uh, did George Who's initiatives maybe continue to outperform even as you, you tried to, uh, to factor them in more fully? 
Yeah, yes, Mark. I mean, we're absolutely thrilled by the performance on the quarter. Again, you know, it's the strength of the platform model and the go-to-market efforts that George has been uh, leading. You know, the, the strength, which is broad-based across the customer base, and as, as Jeff and George talked about earlier, you were still working on improving the uh, the forecasting of this go-to-market motion is new. But again, we're just pleased with the results and pleased with the uh, future outlook. Okay, and then um, Jeff, I wanted to ask you just regarding the Tulio Super Network. At Signal, there were a bunch of announcements. I think you had announced it, it now serves more than 90% of the world's GDP. There was a comment that it can detect 97% of the network incidents in real time. It's GDPR compliant. I'm, I'm just curious, do you see much more work to be done uh, to advance the super network, or is that at a point where uh, it's, it's so unique that you can sort of shift your engineering efforts a little more rapidly um, into some of the newer vectors like payments and AI and bots and so on and so forth? Um, please limit your questions to one per person. Uh, Elmark, uh, I, I will answer your extra question. Um, you know, the, the work of the super network is, is truly never done. I mean, the communications, the global telecommunications network is a very, very complex thing. And if you think about it, reaching the world's population reliably in a cost-effective way uh, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a huge challenge. And so we continue to invest in that uh, for SMS, for voice, for phone numbers, and now also on the programmable wireless side as well with our new super SIM. And so uh, we believe that uh, there's uh, always a, a great amount of work that we can do to better serve our customers uh, when listening to the things they need from us, uh, that we can invest and build a better super network all the time. Your next question comes from the line of the Vonsory of William Blair. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Hey, guys. Thanks for taking my question. I apologize about the background noise. Kazima, my friend, uh, welcome, and uh, we good to work together again. Um, and this question is, is, is for, I guess, all of you, but I'd just love to understand, you know, it's obviously early days for some of the more recent products, but any early read on the, early read, sorry, on the level of interest you're seeing on pay, sort of the, the inter integration with Stripe there, and autopilot, sort of any sort of uh, growth there, and then sort of any new IoT use cases. Thank you. Absolutely, Bhavan. Uh, you know, I think as all of those, um, uh, you know, pay and autopilot, I mean, these are brand new products we just introduced about two and a half weeks ago. So, uh, and obviously still in beta, we, we just brought them uh, to the market. So it's too early to say, obviously, they're not uh, producing revenue uh, yet as beta products. But, you know, in the beta stage, what we do is we work with customers. We see the use cases they're building. We understand, you know, the things we got right, the things that will uh, become the roadmap, the things we want to add to it or change as everything goes on. So far, I would say for both of these products, we've had fantastic feedback from early customers. You know, at Signal, both of them had a lot of working sessions um, with customers where they could meet the products, get their hands on, start using them. So far, feedback has been great, but obviously there's only a couple of weeks of that feedback um, to date, and it takes time for customers to build on them, deploy them, use them, and, uh, and give us even more feedback as we continue to scale. Uh, as you asked about um, IoT, uh, Wireless as a product is doing really well. We're very excited. We think that has a, an enormous opportunity. Um, it is a small part of our revenue today, but obviously uh, the IoT market is a very big one, and uh, we think this is the early stages of the very large um, opportunity, which is the whole IoT market. Uh, we're particularly excited to launch the NB IoT product that we uh, brought to market with T-Mobile uh, at uh, Signal that we announced a couple of weeks ago. Because as I've mentioned uh, before on earnings calls, uh, the new protocols that are coming online to power even more IoT use cases uh, are very power efficient and very cost efficient. And if you can bring the cost uh, down for IoT connectivity to connect to the cellular networks, you're always connected. You're not beholden to working Wi-Fi and passwords or Bluetooth pairing and all this sort of stuff. It's just connected to the network. You don't have to think about it. And if that is extremely cost efficient and you can purchase the lifetime of connectivity when you buy the device, there's no subscription plans or anything like that, you know, that's going to increase the number of, of, of types of devices that can be built, uh, as well as battery life. And as I mentioned, if you can get the uh, battery life down to something that's always connected to the network uh, and powered on a single AA battery for five years, you know, we think that, too, will change the nature of the kinds of devices that can be brought to market. So with prices uh, of connectivity coming down, battery life coming down, uh, or battery life going up, uh, this is going to rapidly expand the number of things that can be built in an IoT world. So we're very excited about 20 levels. And, hey, Balin, this is uh, George. 
I want to add on a little bit to that um, from my perspective. Obviously, as Jeff said, these products are new, some of them. But I think it's very interesting to see that, for example, the reaction um, kind of apples to apples over the same time period versus understand last year uh, for autopilot, for example, I think is, is much stronger. And I think it really speaks to the power of our, one of the things I get excited about in this business is the power of our, of our, of our business model and our product model and customer engagement model that if you look at the energy around Flex, you know, that was really based on our learnings from Task Router, which is a smaller API, and then it really evolved into something that we're really, really excited about. And the same way I think Understand evolved into, um, into Autopilot. And, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see where pay and other things evolve over time. Um, but, you know, I think the power of an API platform model to identify huge ideas with relatively small investments is something that I think is really unique to our model. And I think that, you know, the, the, the evolution you're seeing in the AI front, even as Jeff said, the evolution in the wireless front with some of these new announcements, I think is one of the reasons I'm so optimistic about the potential of this company. Super helpful, guys. Thank you. Congrats. Your next question comes from the line of Alex Zukin of Piper Jaffray. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Hey, guys. Uh, congratulations again on another quarter of kind of meaningfully accelerating growth a- across every metric. And I guess I wanted to ask about how we should think about that dollar-based net expansion metric, given its expansion here over the last couple of quarters. Um, and, and what type of rates do you guys think are sustainable over – maybe the intermediate term or the short term, and when will Flex become a meaningful contributor to that metric? Yeah, Alex, this is Lee. So, you know, again, that expansion rate is is being driven by driving deeper relationships with our uh, customers and product velocity, you know, uh, releasing new products. So nothing, I wouldn't say it's really an inflection point. It's just our business as usual uh, in the power of the platform model. You know, going forward, uh, Longer term, right, it's extremely high expansion rate. Uh, in the long term, the, the older cohorts will uh, become larger, and they do grow um, le- at a less rate than the uh, new cohorts. So over time, that will decrease, but we still think it's going to be meaningfully important going forward. Your next question comes from the line of Michael Turn of Deutsche Bank. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Good afternoon. Thanks. Conversations around Flex coming out of Signal have been notably positive, especially around some implementation times and the pricing model you're providing there. I just was hoping you could provide us with an update around what you're seeing in that market today. It's more around the vision where you're headed and, and where we are in partner involvement there as well. Oh uh, well, thanks for the question, Michael. This is George. Yeah, I think we're I think Flex is very very exciting. Um, we've gotten really really strong feedback from the customers in the in the beta programs. And you've seen that with Shopify and with Lyft now. So I think that's the most important thing. I think that we believe we have a hit product on our hands. Um, and what we're doing is we're building the capacity with the cut, with the, with things like our partner ecosystem, uh, to support, uh, the successful deployment of the product over time. Um, and certainly while we're early days in that, I think, you know, we, we're growing the number of certified consultants on the Flex platform. We're making investments there. So I, I think that you, you're, you're, you're feeling and you're hearing and uh, from the customers and from us. Um, the momentum behind this product, and uh, and we're kind of putting every every we're putting our wood behind this arrow to to make it successful. So we're going to do everything we can to do that. Um, and I think that um, you know we're still early, but uh, early early signs are very very uh, promising. Thanks. Congrats on the strong results. Nice time to drop the mic, Lee. Your next question comes from line of Heather Bellini of Goldman Sachs. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Great, thank you, and apologize for the back, background noise as well. Um, I just wanted to follow up a little bit about Flex adoption, and I was just trying to think through. I mean, obviously, you've had a phenomenal developer-led model. I'm just wondering, how do you see Flex adoption kind of taking hold or if, if you look out ahead? What's the mix, do you think, look like between developer-led versus partner-led momentum? Thank you. Well, I think that um, right now, this is George again, you know, right now, um, the primary driver is developer-led. And, you know, I think it's interesting that even after our GA announcement, um, we had a meaningful in, uh, inflow of new developer signups for Flex. So, and, you know, the product's been announced, uh, you know, in the market for a while, uh, even though it's pre-GA. So I still think there's a lot of room to run in terms of developer momentum. 90% of 
you know, the, the, the world's contact center infrastructure is still on premise. And I think there's a lot of developers that, you know, want to move to the cloud. So I think for, for there, we're, we're still in the early innings of that. Um, but I think the, the partner momentum will grow over time. I was very impressed with, um, the turnout, um, in the, in the partner summit. Uh, at Signal, and you know, I think one of the reasons it was over, probably actually, I'm very convinced the reason it was overflowing was because of Flex. That that there's a lot of um, partners and resellers that I spoke to that are you know still serving the legacy world that want to move to the cloud, and they see Flex as a very uh, not only a, a great technology fit for what the market needs, but also a very partner friendly model in terms of um, you know the build mentality uh, that's required for the product. So uh, I, I think you'll see both grow over time. Um, which one will overtake which one over time? I think it's hard to say because we're just so early. I mean, the product just G8 two and a half weeks ago. Um, but it, it's, uh, I think there's, there's opportunity in both. Thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Brent Braceland of KeyBank Capital Markets. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Hello. This is uh, Clark Jeffries on for Brent. Thank you for taking the question. Uh, Coming out of Signal, we've been receiving uh, inbounds from investors trying to understand the IoT opportunity, uh, but I, I kind of wanted to dig in terms of how Flex plays into that. Uh, it seems to me that there's a subtle but distinct advantage in terms of IoT support uh, granted by the programmability. So I was just wondering, are you already planning for how Flex may be used for internal use cases in terms of supporting uh, organizations with a lot of internal IoT footprint? Yeah, thanks, Clark. This is Jeff. So, you know, it's interesting when we launched um, uh, when we launched Flex back in Q1. Actually, one of the demos that we gave was an IoT integration because something we are hearing from customers who are deploying IoT use cases is that when they need support, having diagnostics and having data about those devices uh, available to agents is critical, and also having uh, alerts uh, basically trigger contact center actions coming from those devices is an emerging use case in contact centers. And ones that, you know, fixed feature monolithic applications are just not going to be well suited to solve because they lack the flexibility. And so this is one of the use cases we've thought about when we built Flex. And one of the beautiful things about Flex is that, uh, as its name implies, it is completely flexible. And so uh, emerging workloads around IoT or things that are specific to the workflows of a company who is deploying IoT and wants to integrate uh, those, those data payloads or alerts and things like that that are triggering communications with customers, they can build those integrations into Flex uh, pretty easily. In fact, the work type that occurs inside of Flex, uh, you know, you can think of calls and chats, you know, those are typical interactions you think of with a call center, but uh, Flex has a very flexible notion of what's the type of work in which people need to do. And one of the types that we envisioned here was IoT-generated uh, work, uh, work items. And uh, it actually was one of the demos we used when we launched Flex uh, on stage earlier this year. So um, I think there is something there, but it's obviously early both in IoT as well as in, uh, as in Flex. But I, I think that would be an area that could be interesting as time goes on. Perfect. Thank you. The next question comes from line of Rishi Jalaria of DA Davidson. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Hey, guys. Thanks for taking my questions. Uh, just, you know, really quickly, I think one of the exciting things out of uh, uh, Signal, uh, out of many announcements, was just seeing the kind of launch of uh, uh, Twilio Pay and, and um, you know, talking to, to the people from Stripe who are kind of excited to have this, this joint, you know, sort of product, so to speak. Uh, just, just going back to talking about the partner ecosystem, is that something that you think you might be able to see with, with more, you know, other software vendors down the line where there's kind of this, this joint uh, uh, effort in, in kind of product development and, and product launch? Thanks. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a great, um, that's a great question. And, you know, certainly we've partnered with other companies um, to deliver parts of our solution in the past. Uh, for example, you know, we partner with Google for um, for speech recognition uh, uh, as, as a good as a good example of that. You know, I, I think that with uh, with some of our newer um, some of our newer technologies, I think that it's really opening doors that we hadn't had before. I think I mentioned Flex already as one of them, but even wireless, for example, you know, we've announced partnerships with Singtel and others uh, that you know were just not companies that we were working with in the past in this kind of way. So uh, I think that as the the footprint, the product footprint uh, broadens. I think it opens, you know, many more degrees of freedom in terms of partners for interesting opportunities like Stripe and, 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 and so on and so forth, which is why I think we've 
and one of the reasons, not the primary reasons, but one reason why we've continued to invest in the in the partner program in a big way starting this year. Got it. Thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Will Power of Bard. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Yeah, great. Thanks. Um, yeah, no, great to see the, the broad-based uh, strength again. I wonder if you could give us any breakdown between, you know, U.S.-based companies and, and companies based, uh, you know, outside the U.S. Are you seeing similar growth rates across, across both uh, regions? And, and any difference in the types of products where you're seeing this type of growth across, um, you know, different regions? Thanks. Yeah, hi, this is Lee. So companies headquartered outside of the U.S. Uh, was 26% of total revenue, and international is growing a bit faster than the uh, U.S. And, you know, we're seeing a usage and strength of, of all products, uh, you know, in both geographies. Okay, thanks. Your next question comes from line of Catherine Trebnick of Derby. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Oh, thank you for taking my call. Uh, question: uh, More on the partner program. Could you? How many partners do you have, and how how many? What's your pace for adding on in a particular quarter? And on to that, how long does it really get them to train them up on all the various products? And are is one product more popular than the other? So I guess that was more than one question. But I'm just looking for a more color around your partner program and the time from when you engage them to revenue. Thank you. Yeah, um, so I think that, you know, the, the partner program, our partner program uh, has multiple um, um, building blocks, if you will, or, or, or aspects to it. So I think, you know, the answer is dependent on what you're talking about. Obviously for our solution partners, um, companies like Zendesk and, and, so, and, and others, um, you know, that, that's been a business that has been there for a while now and is, is, is an important part of our customer base and partner base. And um, I think that that already is, I think, in a in a good state and can, we'll continue to grow that. Uh, for some of our newer motions, um, you know, two that, two that um, are newer, one is our SIs. Um, and for there, you know, uh, the big driver of that is Flex, as I talked about. Um, you know, we're looking to build an ecosystem without giving exact numbers. You know, we, we want to have a healthy, you know, uh, you know, mid to high double digit number of partners um, in the in the ecosystem um, uh, in, a, in a reasonable amount of time. And, um, you know, uh, with a, a, a multiple of that as our you know, certified ecosystem of consultants. Um, and that's just early days. I mean, you know, obviously, as, as Twilio continues to grow and Flux continues to grow, those numbers will multiply over time. But I think that's kind of where we're trying to get to um, in the near term uh, to kind of, I think, support what we see around uh, the opportunity around uh, Flex. And then, you know, we are just beginning to lay the foundation today for um, for resellers, which we have really um, had in very de minimis fashion until this point. Um, and so uh, I think that's another un, a relatively unexplored opportunity, honestly, in partners. So. Um, I think it's a, it's a really exciting time for partners all around. All right. Thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Pat Walravens of JMP Securities. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Oh, great. Thank you, um, and congratulations. Uh, so, George, in your years at Salesforce, you saw, um, you know, economic cycles sort of come and go, right? Um, I'm just wondering how you would characterize the macroeconomic and spending environment that you're seeing today. Well, even though I had an economics degree, macro was my worst uh, subject. So <laughs> I'm probably probably not the not the best um, not the best prognosticator of all those kind of things. I will say this, which is that obviously, um, you know, uh, given the nature of our business, that as companies and as as consumers and and the general economy is healthy, of course, it's going to be a, a tailwind for our business. Um, and so, you know, we will. Uh, we will, uh, you know, we will continue to um, to focus on our, our core strategy, which is, you know, focus on customer engagement, um, because I think that whether it's up cycles or down cycles, one thing I saw at Salesforce was that, you know, you, you always had to come back to your customer. If times were good, you had to invest more. If times were tough, you had to be even more focused on your customer to be competitive. So I think that really um, is something – I think it's good to have a business model that your your what you do is relevant in all cycles, and I think that is um, – that is true True in my old company and true here as well. 
Your next question comes from the line of Jonathan Keyes of Summit Insight Group. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Great. <clears throat> Thanks for taking my question and um, great results. Um, uh, great way to, to end on a high note, Lee. Uh, good luck to you there. And uh, happy Election Day to you, Jeff. I agree with you in terms of uh, taking a stand on hate speech as a nonpartisan issue. Uh, my question is uh, on, I guess, this partnership with uh, T-Mobile. Uh, I guess I, I want to understand it better here. In terms of, is this something that just limits the developers to the narrowband network with T-Mobile? Um, I mean, I guess I haven't seen too many of these partnerships more you know, with the carriers. You seem to just aggregate all under the super network. There, you have, if anything, you have a, a bunch of carriers there, and you talk about them in mass. And this is kind of unique in terms of just singling one out and then developing a partnership on their network. Just wondering, um, are you looking to add to that uh, partnership? Uh, how does this limit in terms of the developers and what they can do with it? Thanks. Yeah, generally, our product, our SMS product, and that wireless, um, the playbook has been we've started in the United States and then expanded over time. And so I think that's pretty similar here. It's, uh, it's actually also a unique period of time for NBIoT because these protocols are just being rolled out now. And so uh, T-Mobile has just lit up their MBIOT network here in the United States, and we expect other carriers are in the process of doing that or going to be doing that in the coming, uh, coming year around the world. And as they do, it would make sense for us to have a product that uh, allows the developer to uh, build something that works everywhere in the world. But, you know, on day one of a product, we've, we've announced it in the United States, and similar to what we did with our um, – uh, super SIM on the uh, not narrowband side, the broadband side of wireless. We started in the United States with T-Mobile. Now we've created the Super SIM, and we work with other partners around the world. I can imagine the same thing could happen with NBIoT. But these networks are brand new. Okay, great, thanks. Your last question comes from the line of Mike Lattimore of Northland Securities. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Hey guys, thanks for taking my call and congrats on a great quarter. Um, my question is, what percent of your flex deals are replacing the underlying contract uh, center's infrastructure versus adding enhancement to it? And then what's the process for selling uh, flex? Is it through the tra traditional channels like the master ones? Um, sorry, can you repeat the second part of your question again? Uh, will you, basically, will you sell flex through traditional channels like uh, you have in the past? Um, so, in, in terms of the first question, uh, you know, we do see a little bit of both. We do see we do see a, um, replacement as well as augmentation. Um, our larger transactions tend to be replacing some incumbent um, legacy solution. Uh, in terms of the channels, uh, you know, we're selling Flex the same way today that we're selling our other products, um, which is uh, a little bit self-service, a little bit through our direct sales team. Um, and uh, and then I think what is different about Flex is I think there will be more partner opportunity for that going forward, and we're definitely seeing a lot of partner demand to uh, do services around Flex and also people that want to resell the product. So um, I, I think there's an opportunity there over time, um, but that would require us uh, building an infrastructure to support that, um, which we would be in the early days of doing right now. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. There are no further questions at this time. Thank you for participating in today's conference. You may now disconnect.